Okay, good evening, everybody, uh, and welcome. I am Amanda Kurtz, Deputy Town Clerk, and I have a few statements for the record before we get started. Tonight's regularly scheduled Herndon Town Council work session is a virtual meeting. Next week's, public, next week's meeting is a public hearing and individuals are encouraged to participate and to provide comments for the record at town.clerk at herndon-va.gov. The work session this evening is conducted electronically pursuant to Virginia Code Section 2.23708.2 as amended, the order of the Governor EO-53 as amended, and in accordance with Ordinance 20-0-23, Continuity of Governmental Operations During Pandemic Disaster, COVID-19, adopted by the Herndon Town Council as amended. Proper notice of the electronic meeting was provided in accordance with section 2.23708.2 of the Code of Virginia, along with information for viewing the meeting and submitting comments for the record. The agenda and meeting materials are available on the town's website. Electronic meetings will begin with a roll call to determine a quorum. All votes, including adjournment, will be by roll call vote. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Amanda. Um, I will call our June 2nd uh, Town Council work session to order um, and ask the clerk to please call the roll. Town Manager Bill Ashton. Town Manager Bill Ashton is present. Town Attorney Lisa Yates. Town Attorney Lisa Yates, present. Vice Mayor Olam. Vice Mayor Olam, present. Council Member Baker. Jennifer Baker, present. Council Member DeLagula. Council Member DeLagula, present. Council Member DeCall. Council Member DeCall, present. Council Member Friedrichs. Council Member Friedrichs, present. Um, Council Member McKenna will be absent this evening. Mayor Merkel. Uh, Lisa Merkel is here. So uh, for the record, we do have a quorum electronically. Councilman McKenna wanted me to let you all know he had a work commitment um, that he was not expecting this evening. So that's why he's unable to join us. Um, as stated by the clerk, tonight's meeting is conducted by electronic means pursuant to the appropriate laws. Um, as usual, I'll ask everyone to, to physically raise their hand so I can recognize you for comments and try to remember to state your name before your comments so that our record is, is, um, is easy to follow. Um, with that, I will um, move to the town manager, uh, Mr. Bill Ashton, who has an update on the continuity of operations and matters related to the emergency and maybe some other things. So, Mr. Town Manager. Thank you, Madam Mayor. For the record, I'm Bill Ashton, the town manager. I just wanted to give you all a brief update on COVID-related activities that have occurred um, since last we spoke. Um, the biggest one was that we moved into phase one um, as, as Northern Virginia moved into phase one of reopening. Uh, phase one of reopening is a, has some very limited um, opportunities for businesses to begin to get back on uh, track. Uh, one of them was the uh, need for, or the opportunity for outdoor seating. Um, the town had worked very diligently on creating opportunities for our restaurants to avail themselves of this uh, opportunity. And uh, we revamped the process, the approval process, and we to include both uh, restaurants on private land as well as that on public land. And uh, we were able to uh, reach out to all of our restaurants to see who wanted to be part of this. Uh, we received uh, 28 applications uh, between Thursday noon and Friday in the afternoon. We were able to approve 27 of them within 24 hours. And for the public areas, we were able to get um, barricades put in place to protect diners from vehicles in, in those locations as well. Um, it was a phenomenal team effort for, by, uh, by DPW, CD, um, primarily the zoning administrator, uh, led by Dennis Holstey and, and, um, and Jenny Tripoli and, and few others that truly did uh, some yeoman's work late last week to get some vibrancy back into our town. On uh, the notes of the town related elements, uh, parks, uh, Breedy Park, the parking lot and tennis courts are now open. Uh, we are going to keep the playgrounds, uh, fields, restrooms, and basketball courts closed for now. 
uh, as we examine when the appropriate time and the phasing sequence of reopening, we can open them. We've also opened up the parking lot to Runnymede Park. The trails had always been open. Now the lot is open. Uh, Spring Street Park also opened this week. Uh, Stanton Park also opened this week. Trailside Park, the parking lots were opened by the weekend. Uh, we removed the barricades on the skate park uh, Monday morning. So the skate park is now open. Uh, tennis courts of Bruin and Shandon are also opened. Um, as I said earlier, playgrounds, uh, town playgrounds around town are closed for now while we work through some of the um, uh, guidance that we are receiving from CDC and BDH regarding transmission risk and cleaning protocols and the like. While we work through that, we'll keep those closed. Um, we are working right now on ball fields, uh, the sand volleyball courts, and we should be in a position to make an announcement later this week. Um, HMC, we continue to make modifications in HMC so as to conduct business while observing all social distancing guidelines. Uh, we are still probably two weeks out from that, uh, but we're working diligently on that. That will include things like sneeze guards uh, at our customer service counters, consolidating customer service counters, um, putting uh, stanchions up to guide traffic, one entry door, one exit door, markers on the floor. It would include um, if you have business beyond the counters that you'd have to make an appointment and where we're gonna hold those appointments in order to, uh, to keep staff space decompressed. Um, and those things are being worked on as we speak. Um, the most popular thing that happened last week is the golf course reopened on Wednesday. Uh, the clubhouse remains closed, but A. Carney was able to serve patrons uh, with a limited menu outside. Um, we were sold out over the weekend. It, it is just rocking. Fortunately, the weather is cooperating very well with us. Um, We've done some suspension of some of the rates that we have to entice people to come in at certain times because of the demand. And we've also suspended some uh, elements of the annual pass because of our limited number of carts that are available that are available since we're putting one person per cart. Um, with that, that's where we are with COVID related uh, issues. Now, over the weekend, the governor issued a second state of emergency for the Commonwealth. And this stemmed from the horrific, tragic event in Minneapolis and the ensuing protests uh, that stemmed from them. Um, so the governor issued the state of emergency for that, 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 it, that, those issues on Sunday. And I've asked Maggie DeBoer, Chief Maggie DeBoer, to step in and quick, give you a quick a um, couple words from her perspective on those things. And with your indulgence, Madam Mayor, I'd like to turn it over to Chief DeBoer. Absolutely. Good evening, Chief. Uh, good evening, uh, Madam Mayor and Town Council. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Yes. Um, it's uh, It's been a difficult week, a week and a half, two weeks. I'll tell you that um, there's a lot of people struggling in this profession, and it's not just limited here to Herndon. It's limited to all over the state, all over the country. Um, we're in a really difficult spot. And I can tell you, honestly, uh, in 34 years, I've never seen one this difficult. Uh, and it's largely something that we know is not going to go away anytime soon. And it's just so painful. Uh, it's so truly painful to see the change in attitude toward officers and toward the profession because of an incident by a, a few, a very few people. Uh, it has undone so much of what we, we have done as a profession, uh, and there is no quick fix to this. Uh, and we know that, and we're trying to stay focused. Uh, but in reality, I, I will tell you, I have people on edge. Um, there was nine officers shot across the country last night. Uh, several were run over. Two officers in Richmond were shot. There was one shot in the back of the head, ambushed in Las Vegas. Um, so those realities are real for us. But uh, I have been urging our, our officers to uh, remain very vigilant, um, but also understand that we are blessed with the community that we have here in Herndon. They have been tremendous with the support. That does not negate the danger for them because it's the opportunists that we worry about. It's not the community. We know, I can tell you, we know our community is behind us. We know that each of you are behind us. That's incredibly important and comfortable um, to the HPD staff here. Uh, I, I can't undersell that enough, um, but we still need to be very careful. And uh, part of that is just trying to deal with where this profession's going. And, and I'll tell you, I, um, I think one of the more difficult things that I'm dealing with also 
is my role in the Virginia Chiefs board. Uh, I sit in second in line uh, on that board, and we are dealing with the governor's office on a daily basis. And the issues um, are not easy for us to deal with. They're not easy for the governor's side to deal with. Um, but we got to find some common ground and we have to make some progress forward. Um, we know there are problems in the profession. We have been fighting, especially at the state level, we have been fighting to fix problems in this profession for years. And we've made some ground and in other places we have not. And this should be an opportunity for us to do that, hopefully, without a rash reaction about what people think is right to fix this uh, profession. Because I think all of us who truly are engaged and committed know what we need to fix it. And it starts with a people issue. And it's about bringing the right people in the door. And when you bring the people in the door and they're not doing the wrong thing, it's about getting rid of those people. So um, we have some challenges because a recent poll that was done in February said that 87% of police departments in this nation were struggling desperately uh, to hire good people. Um, I can't imagine what that poll would look like if it was done today. Um, so uh, we have some real challenges ahead of us, and we're going to have to find a way to get there and create trust. And, and you know, the whole issue about racism, we know racism exists, you know, with, with officers. I mean, I can't tell you I have racist officers here because I don't believe I do. Um, but we also know that racism is, is throughout society in every profession. The difference for us is the outcomes when we get it wrong are tragic. Um, and you can't fix that. Um, there's no margin of error for us getting those things wrong, which is why it's so important that we bring the right people in the door and retain the right people throughout you know, their careers. So I just wanted you to know that we have been committed to that for a long time here. We have made every effort to keep the right people here, to bring the right people here, to get rid of the wrong people. Um, and we're and we're no less committed to that now than we were, you know, five years ago. Um, but we're going to stay that course, um, and we're going to continue to fight to do the things that we need to do to make sure that our community continues to trust us. Uh, I will also say that I've had a lot of very supportive emails from the community in various places. Um, that's very comforting to me, and I have passed that on to our troops. Um, but they've also thrown a lot of questions at us about, uh, you know, why don't you look at this and why don't you do this and why aren't you up to date on use of force policies? We are very current. We are very up to date on our policies and our procedures and our tactics. As a matter of fact, the only reason we hadn't uh, posted our general orders previous to, yeah, I think this morning online is because we change them so frequently. Ours don't sit for five or 10 years. They're constantly evolving. So, uh, but we did post them this morning so that, you know, we could make it very easy for the community to answer really a lot of their own questions about what is your policy on this? What is your procedure on that? Um, and, and we have been long before I got here, a CALEA accredited agency, but think about this, less than 5% of agencies throughout the entire country are CALEA accredited. We are one of those 5%. So I know we're, making all the efforts to do the right things and your support to do that uh, honestly cannot be understated so i thank you for that the long-winded answer but uh, <laughs> i just wanted to make sure that you understood uh how much i appreciate the support that we've gotten here from the community and from each of you thank you chief thank you for being here uh, mr town manager i'm going to turn it back to you you have further comments or are there questions for i, I do not manage? madam mayor does council have any questions for the manager or for the chief? Uh, yes, sir, Cesar. Hi, uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, Council Member Delegate. Um, chief, I, I just want to tell you, uh, thank you for the support. And let us know what council could do to help facilitate or ease some of that tension. Um, just, uh, just as an FYI, uh, I have a nephew. He's, um, he's a great kid. He's 12. He's got some issues that he's dealing with after a divorce. Um, he tends to be a little bit on the brown side. And I can tell you this, he feels safe here. Because every time we walk around, he waves to the police. You guys wave back. Yeah. So 
I know it's tough out there. I know some people don't have that experience, but this is from a 12 year old and I had the talk with him uh, about four weeks ago about if he ever gets stopped and he doesn't have that issue here. He feels safe here. So for whatever it's worth, I just wanted to share that. With you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Tell everyone that story. Um, is there anyone else who would like to ask a question or have a comment? Uh, so everybody, I, mean, I saw Jen first and then I saw Signe and then I'll go to the vice mayor. <laughs> yeah, I love that story. That's fantastic to hear. And yeah, Chief, thank you. I thought what you wrote on the Herndon Police Department page was excellent. You did a great job of, you know, um, sharing, of course, that the, the tragedy of what happened and that although that those are fellow police officers that did that and how that erodes the trust but that and that how important trust is and to to your force and that's something we rely on you for and that you're so good at building with our community and with with your officers um and i know it's hard to then talk about other officers who we all clearly can see they did something very wrong and i know that can be a difficult position for police officers to be in and i really appreciated the way you handled it and what you wrote about also appreciate that you're working with the community to have the the um, protest and the march that uh, we're going to have on Thursday evening. So thank you for that. Um, just again, one of the just best parts about working in Herndon is is that we have this sense of community that we do look out for each other and we do have um, the support of our police and our and we support our police in return. So thank you for that. Thank you. Was it Signe that I said next? Okay, thank you. So um, <clears throat> right after um, Daryl Smith passed away, one of my neighbors across the street who's lived in this house ever since my neighborhood was built um, said to me, he's never lived in a community before where the police and the community were so deeply entwined. There was so much mutual trust. Um, and when I go you know, knocking on people's doors to talk to them, and ask them what their favorite thing about Herndon is. Many people of color tell me it's our police. Um, and I think that's a telling thing. You have shown our community that, you know, you care. And, you know, I am so proud whenever I, I look at some other communities and see what's going on, I just think, well, I know our police chief has our best, um, our citizens' best interests at heart. I also really was uh, touched by what the Alexandria police did yesterday, and I'm sure you saw that on YouTube. But um, it's very important to our communities of color, I think, to have police stand up and say how it affects them and how much they care about their community. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Vice Mayor. <clears throat> Thank you. And I'm really sorry that we aren't going to have our national police night, possibly this year because of the crowds, because I think that shows how involved, <clears throat> excuse me, our officers are with the community. And I know my youngest son had a couple of officers from the Herndon police were his coaches. And so for years, every time see them and when I see those officers today they will ask me how mad he and he's 28 you know grown and moved away but I I agree our our officers are so incorporated in the community and they know people and they get out there not just at national night out but also at the schools uh, when the officer died his mustache pink and we know who we're talking about the kids at the schools love that and that just makes you the beloved Awesome. I'm sorry you're going through this and you've definitely got my support and all of my family. Thank you. Uh, Pradeep, did you have anything? I think you're the only one I haven't called on. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And thank you, Chief. Uh, we are very lucky and we are very blessed to have the police department, you know, which is so engaged with the community. And I think that respect goes both ways, community and the police force both ways. And uh, I so agree with uh, Council Member Fredericks that, you know, when 
I went knocking the doors whenever I meet our residents and I ask them what is one of the most favorite thing in Herndon and they always mention the police department and that tells how much our community trust and has faith in the police department and then police department has equally worked for the community to earn that respect so we trust you we have faith on you let us know if there is anything we can do uh, like uh, council member de la guela said to facilitate or to ease the tension if there is anything we can do we are ready to do it and um, keep doing the great work so again thank you so much uh, thank you. Mayor, may I add one thing? Uh, certainly, please. Uh, uh, two things, actually. Quickly, in response to uh, Vice Mayor Olam's comment about National Night Out, that already has been moved to October. So there is an opportunity there uh, that we may be able to still hold that event. I mean, I certainly hope that that's the case. Uh, we actually have been kind of advocating for that for years because that's truly when Crime Prevention Month is. and and. Uh, was the typical time for that, but they had always held it in August. And there's more people that are not away in October too. So we could actually have bigger events uh, and less hot weather if we do it then. So if if we're not restricted from COVID related issues, then we hope to have a nice uh, big event uh, with the community in October. And we will certainly give you prior advance of that date uh, very soon. Um, just the other point that I've, I failed to mention very quickly was our biggest concern right now, despite um, the issues, is is really safety and protection for not only our officers, but also the community. Um, the civil unrest is unacceptable on every level, and it's certainly not a path to peace on either side. So we are working very hard to ensure that any event that we do support uh, and that any issue that could spill over into town, that we protect our businesses, uh, protect our residents and, and citizens here, because that is just not the kind of attention we want here for the town of Herndon. Thank you. Um, I just issued a statement right before the meeting started um, about this, and I concur with everything my colleagues have said. Um, my mom always tells me that where, where I live isn't like where everybody else lives. I mean, this really <laughs> is a great place, and we all know that. Um, the relationship with the with the community that the police have, though, it, it didn't just happen. Um, I think there are a lot of people who live here um, who don't realize that Herndon was the site of race riots in 1974, following an officer um, involved shooting of an African American uh, resident. Um, it was a Fairfax County officer. It wasn't a Herndon police officer, but that doesn't really matter. Um, Riots ensued for a couple of days. Uh, Smitty was a brand new police officer, rookie, 24 years old, and was there. You imagine that position he was in. But after that, the town started uh, taking on efforts to reach out to the community. Smitty started that homework club, and it was in the basement of, mm -hmm. I forget which building at that time. Um, the Com Herning Community Center spun out of that unrest and needing to be able to connect with the community. Um, it's taken years. It doesn't just happen overnight. So right. it's when, when I see these, anytime any sort of tragedy happens at any level, and I see mayors and police chiefs on the news, it's every mayor and police chief's worst nightmare to be those people on the news. And um, I just hope that the communities across the country, that that from this awful situation that, that our country finds ourselves in, that hopefully there will be some good that comes from it like happened in Herndon. Um, it takes leadership, commitment, compassion, care, trust, and time. So um, thank you, Chief, and for all the people here before you that helped make that happen. And um, I pray that we never find ourselves behind a microphone together. So thank you for being here. Um, anybody else before I move on? Town attorney's being really quiet over there. That's okay. Uh, Ms. Baker. Yeah, Council Member Baker, I know I already spoke, so thank you for letting me speak again. Um, I wanted to touch on something that the police um, that Chief DeBoard mentioned. So certainly you deserve the praise, your your officers deserve the praise. We are really thankful. And as Mayor Merkel just, just stated really well, we we live in a place that is different. Um, and I do feel like we're, we're the exception and gonna continue to be the exception. Um, I do feel it's worth stating though, that certainly racism exists. We're all aware of that. It exists in our citizens. And if not in our officers, certainly unconscious bias exists, right? And I, uh, I do appreciate that the police force with the help of the town manager has been really vigilant 
uh, vigilant about mm -hmm. training and making sure that we are focused on that because we all have that bias and it just can be, as you said, Chief DeBoard, it can be tragic when those mm -hmm. um, things happen within when a person has the ability to use force on another human yep. being. So thank you Absolutely. for taking that really seriously. Thank you for taking recruiting so seriously and looking at that so carefully and making sure that we uh, are getting the very best recruits possible. And of course, continuing to train them and to train our existing officers that um, it, with the way in which we want um, that very important role to protect and to serve that, that we empower them with. So thank you for that. Thank you guys. And Chief, thank you again for being here this evening. We haven't gotten to see you on a WebEx yet. Yeah, no, I've been hiding. I know. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Um, we do have a whole bunch of public hearings this evening. Um, but the good news is we're going to have a concurrent staff reports on almost all of them. So um, we'll move right into that. Several public hearings on the agenda tonight. Um, the first eight relate to the use of eminent domain for streetscapes phase three in the Center Street, um, Eldon Street intersection projects. Uh, the proposed ordinances for the streetscapes phase three project would authorize the use of eminent domain for the acquisition of fee simple interests and temporary easements for public pedestrian utility and streetscape improvements along Eldon Street in downtown Herndon on five parcels of property. Um, do I need to read those into the record, Madam Town Attorney, the addresses? No. You do not. Okay. <laughs> Just you do you, at the pub. You do at the public right. hearing. Okay, perfect. Um, all right, so you guys have your agendas with you so you can see that. Um, the proposed um, ordinances for the Eldon Street intersection project authorize the use of eminent domain for the acquisition of fee simple interest permanent easements and a temporary easement for transportation facility improvements at the center and Eldon Street intersection on four parcels of property, which are listed here. Um, I will ask the clerk first um, if we have received any comments for the record on these items. Madam Mayor, we did not receive any comments on these items. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe we will before next week. Um, I'm going to recognize uh, John Irish, who's our Deputy Director of Public Works, um, for a collective presentation on all eight items. Um, and he'll be followed by input from our Deputy Town Attorney, Laurie Sigler. And um, before we move into that, I did want to um, just clarify, and I have a question for John. Um, under our uh, COG ordinance, or where we are only working on items that are, you know, critical to the continuity of government. How, how do these, why, why are these um, items that we are looking at under those circumstances? Well, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Um, the main reason this falls into the category of uh, the reason to include it under the uh, current circumstances are there are two distinct projects I'll describe. One of them in particular, the Streetscapes Phase 3, is uh, funded with federal funds that are under current guidelines, certain restrictions. And in this case, there is an advertisement date for the project that is a deadline of June 24, 2020. In order not to jeopardize the project's funding, Primarily, we need to have the right of way and easements taken care of through this eminent domain process. The Center Street and Eldon Street intersection is not under the same requirements, but because of the two projects being integral to each other, we do want to try to bid them at the same time so we can get um, take advantage of scale of the two projects together. So that is the primary reason. And as you know, transportation is still a very important and integral part of our town's infrastructure. So it is still a critical part of that. Okay, Th thank you. I just wanted to clarify that because I suspected we might get some questions from the public on that. So thank you so much. Absolutely. So tonight, like you mentioned, I'm gonna give you a collective overview of the two separate projects. Uh, when Ms. Sigler gets on, she will explain the actual details of the individual properties. But what we have is Streetscapes Phase 3. This is the completion of the Streetscapes project, which started many years ago. And it's basically the improvement of the sidewalk areas with street amenities, uh, the acorn lighting, 
And right now, phase three starts just past Jimmy's on the south side of Elgin Street and just past Sully's Ice House, uh, Sully's on the north side. And they continue to the west and will basically meet up with the center and Elgin Street intersection project as well. The one segment you won't see actually shown in here is a segment that's part of the downtown development, but that section will be developed in the same manner of the streetscapes that you'll see here. Go ahead, slide, please. So this is just a basic diagrammatic picture. You see that the Center and Elm Street project will be to the left-hand side of this picture, and then the it will be seamless with the streetscapes project going to the east. Slide, please. <clears throat> the streetscapes, as I mentioned, is on the south side for the section just past Jimmy's down. To, and the reason it stops where you see it, that's the intersection with the Center and Elgin Street project. And on the north side, that's the section I mentioned that goes from Sully's down across the old ice house. And what's missing on the north side is that section will be completed as a part of the downtown development. Slide, please. So the scope of the improvements for streetscapes is basically finishing up the final phase for that overall project. It's going to include pedestrian bicycle improvements, landscaping, historic lighting fixtures, and also it will include a small section of the remaining section of underground <clears throat> undergrounding for the utilities. And when you see the next slide, you'll see that we're trying to minimize the amount of land acquisition we need. So in the scheme of the overall project, these are relatively small sections. And as we've described in the past on previous projects where we've used the eminent domain process, they usually are not large impositions on the property owners. A lot of it is more easement related than actual taking of right away. Next slide, please. So there are basically um, the streetscapes, five parcels involved, it's actually four different property owners. And the green that you see is temporary construction easements. The red is right away taking. And this is all for just the sidewalk, which allows us to then, after we improve it to maintain it, and becomes part of the public right-of-way access there. Total uh, square footage, you can see the right-of-way is 979 square feet, temporary easements of 336 square feet. Next slide, please. And this gives you an overall time frame. I mentioned it's been a long time to complete this. It started, believe it or not, back in 1998. And the first two phases were completed up through two years ago. And our current schedule is we're in the process of this land acquisition. We've completed the construction plans that are now being reviewed by, by VDOT. And there is a minor piece of utility relocation that will occur here. It's just uh, one small uh, power pole. The current projection is to receive the authorization from VDOT to allow us to advertise we will not be advertising by that June 24th date, but as long as we have secured the easements through the eminent domain process, we will satisfy that requirement. We're actually looking to be uh, going out for bid, excuse me, in either mid to late summer or early fall, depending on how long it takes for VDOT to complete their review. That would hopefully put us in a position to start construction in the same general time frame, and we would expect construction to be completed in no more than about six months. So we would hopefully, pending any real bad weather, be able to complete this by the end of this calendar year or maybe into the first part of the next calendar year. Next slide, please. So Center and Elda is just a continuation, it realigning the intersection that is currently there. Next slide, please. And it also will be adding a traffic signal at that light. So we'll continue the same type of sidewalk improvements um, around that intersection. We're adding pedestrian signals for crosswalks. 
We do have some drainage improvement as well. And the realigning is <clears throat> hopefully going to make it a little bit simpler to go through that intersection in both the turning motions that you would expect with a new signal there. And again, we're trying to utilize as much of the existing right away as possible. Next slide, please. So this involves four separate pieces of property. The two at parcel 75 and 74 have one owner. And again, the green is the temporary construction easement. The red is the right of way take. And the reason that's as significant as it is for parcel 75 is we're adding a right turn lane from northbound center onto eastbound Elgin. And the Fuchsia, I guess you would call it, that is a part for a stormwater easement. When we put that turn lane in, we have to add some stormwater drainage. Next slide, please. And again, this is just a general timeline of where we came from for this particular project. The work session that started this was back in 2015. We're basically trying to follow the same track of advertising again at the same time frame as the Street Skates 3, and then starting construction at the same time and completing in six months or so. The fact that these are two separate projects under the VDOT. Um, parameters, we still will have to bid them as two separate projects, but if we have them bidding at the same time, our hope is that we could find a suitable uh, bidder that would be able to be awarded the contract with both of those projects individually, but at the same time, so we could like a play data band in this case. And that concludes my review. If anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you, sir. Uh, what what questions do we have? Um, or actually, Laurie, did you have comments first, or do you want to take questions? How do you guys want to handle this? It, Madam Mayor, it, it's really your your pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. Um, so, does anybody have questions for Mr. Irish? And then, if after if not, then we'll move on to Ms. Sigler. And of course, you can ask both of them after after both presentations. So, um, okay, well, Laurie. <laughs> Okay, we'll move on to you. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening, Madam Mayor and members of the Town Council. Um, it's nice to be here tonight. Um, I've come here before to talk about um, kind of the same issues in regards to some of the other um, construction projects, the capital projects that um, the town has going on. Um, with this project, to give you a quick overview, you notice you have eight staff reports in your packet. Um, there's a total of nine parcels involved in the projects. And what happened is one parcel, um, the one that had the significant take of right of way on the center and Eldon parcel, um, that the, the appraiser appraised the two parcels together. Um, so that's why we're treating it um, with one staff report. Um, and then there was one offer letter on that. Um, and there's only four property owners amongst all the nine parcels. Um, so we're not dealing with a lot of different uh, property owners um, in that regard. Um, and if you recall, in order to move forward um, with the condemnation, um, the Virginia law requires that number one, the project is for public use, that no more private property can be taken for the project than is necessary to achieve um, the necessary improvements. Um, there has to be a written offer and a bona fide um, effort, um, a bona fide but ineffectual effort to purchase um, and come to an agreement with the property owners. Um, these offer letters went out um, end of April. Um, we have had communications with all but one of the property owners. Um, but we feel at this point that um, that negotiate that the negotiations are at an impasse uh, for the purpose of of us being able to move forward with the project. There are a couple also mortgage or deed of trust holders um, on some of the properties, but not all of them. Um, and of course, we need the mortgage lenders to also convey their interest or sign on to the deed in order to to convey good title. Um, so, again, we can proceed with condemnation um, if we can't agree on, con on compensation or other uh, terms of the settlement um, and the, if the owner is also unable to convey a valid title. 
Um, in order to proceed with uh, a condemnation, we do need to have a public hearing. Um, and that's the purpose of the, the work session tonight and then and then the public hearing next week. Um, it's that um, we can only move forward with the um, action of the town council. Um, and in order for that certificate to be filed, we also had to send another notification letter to the property owners. And that simply states that um, we can't move forward that we can't move forward with filing the certificate no sooner than 30 days from the date of that letter. And then we have 45 days total. Um, we can't file the certificate after the 45th day. Um, those letters to the property owners went out May 15. Um, so those are the, the parameters that we're looking at to move forward. Um, and I think that's just wanted to give you a brief summary again of the process and I'll certainly you know, take any questions uh, that you may have. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so um, what questions do we have uh, for either Lori or John? None? Uh, Signe. Um, so you said we have four property owners and we've been able, we've been in contact with three of them. We've actually had reciprocal conversations with three of them. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. And um, is there any reason? Uh, so is the one that we're not in contact with, with, is that the large one or the other ones? Actually, it is not the large one. It is, it's one of the smaller um, the smaller acquisitions. Okay, that's good news. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else have questions? Uh, Pradeep, and I think I saw Sheila, right? Okay, go ahead, Pradeep. Thank you, Laurie. Uh, my question is, I was about to ask, uh, how long do we anticipate for this condemnation process to go based on our experience? But you said, so we sent uh, the letter on May 15th. Is that correct? Yes, and this is uh, Lori Sigler again. Um, the the notice letters, the offer letters were sent out earlier, but the notice letter was sent out on the fifteenth. So the forty five days would be um, no later than June twenty nine. June twenty nine. Okay, that's right. what I wanted to know. Thank okay. you. Thank you, um, Sheila. This is Sheila Olam. Thank you. Um, on the Church of Jesus Christ, uh, 800 Elgin Street, parcel 0033, how are they going to be impacted if they should make changes? Because they're going to be a significant amount of their property compared to the others. And they're probably going to be non-conforming. So do they get any paper? Uh, Miss uh, Vice Mayor Owen, this is Laurie Sigler again, and I think um, actually from the church property, the large area you saw, which I believe was the color green, was the temporary construction easement. Um, looking at my information, that was 100 and I guess 73 square feet. We only need seven square feet of right of way. From them, and I know when I looked at the um, PowerPoint presentation, if you look, you, it's hard to see the red area on that slide because it is so small. Um, but um, again, the the right the right of way we need is only the seven square feet. The rest of it is only for construction, and that easement um, it terminates after the project is over. Okay, thank you. It went by so fast. <laughs> paying attention to the red and green, but thank you. Thank you. Um, any other questions for Lori or for John this evening? Anybody? No. Okay, thank you. So tonight was easy because, uh, and I believe next week they will be um, all concurrent staff reports once again for the public hearing, um, but we get to do all of the separate public hearing votes and they're all by roll call since we are, well, they may have been by roll call anyway, I believe. so. That'll, that'll take the bulk of our meeting next week. So um, just be ready for that. Um, so next up is an ordinance to consider amending the fiscal year 2020 adopted budget. Um, and I'll ask Amanda, uh, the town clerk, our deputy town clerk, if we've received any comments for the record on this item. 
Uh, no, Madam Mayor, we have not received comments on this item. Okay. Thank you. And um, I believe that Jenny Tripoli is going to be here for uh, for the staff report. And uh, there she is. Oh, and you're at Good home, evening. so maybe we'll hear the puppies. Yes. Well, one of them is sitting right here just waiting okay. to cause trouble. All right. Perfect. So uh, good evening, Madam Mayor, members of council. This is Jenny Tripoli, the director of finance. Um, I know we just talked about the 21 budget and adopted it, um, but I'm coming to you uh, with a request to amend the FY20 budget uh, just for grants or other external revenue sources that were not contemplated during the original FY2020 budget because they happen off cycle. This happens all the time. Um, you get grant uh, dollars, you know, throughout the year um, or things like accidents happen. Um, as you may recall, somebody took out the beautiful lighted sign that tells people they're in the town of Herndon right by Worldgate. Um, so Again, they did recover 100% of that cost through insurance. And uh, so it, it's for things like this. So next slide, please. I'll just run you through it very quickly uh, on the general fund side, the police department, it's about 105,441 dollars. All grant funded either through seized assets um, through the uh, state Internet crimes against children grant. Uh, also, we have a couple of federal selective enforcement grants that we get through the DMV to target speeders and um, people driving under the influence. So this is to. Uh, appropriate dollars for those costs. Department of Public Works, um, as can happen on occasion, we completed some punch list items for a developer and they reimbursed us for that. Also, somebody made a donation for a bench and paid for that. So that's what that is comprised of. Community development, as you know, we get a block grant from Fairfax County for Corey Law's position and that's to appropriate those funds. Um, and then finally, the big chunk is we're going, we're asking for 500,000 of the CARES Act money. Uh, the, that is not the total amount that we received. I anticipate that we're going to have a conversation a discussion item about that in July so we can get into details. But for right now, we've been using existing appropriations to buy the things like PPE, um, extra sanitization, hand sanitizer, masks, things like that. Um, this would appropriate some of that money to then cover those costs. And so you can see on the revenue side, we're increasing um, state and, and federal grant revenues, not otherwise classified as just your miscellaneous item, which is where that donation went and the uh, punch list items went. Uh, E-summons, it's actually restricted. Uh, we get E-summons funds every year. They're to be used only for police items related to electronic ticketing. We don't spend every dollar of it every year, so we hold it over. And so that's where that is coming from. On the capital project side, the expenditures, that $31,609, that's the that's the sign. Uh, and that that is funded by the insurance proceeds. And then on the golf fund side, um, the $1,300 is an insurance recovery. Somebody had attempted to break into one of the storage uh, areas and we were able to recover the cost for that damage. Next slide, please. So really, I just went through all of that with the numbers. This is just the verbiage. If you want to um, read it at your leisure, next slide. And again, with the capital projects um, and again, with the golf fund, it's just this is all insurance recoveries. Next slide, I actually think that's it. It's not a 15 pager this time. Um, I am happy to take any questions that anyone may have. Okay, thank you, Jenny. Uh, what questions do you have for, for Jenny? None? All right. Well, thank you. We like it when it's other people's money. Yes. So, <laughs> especially right now. Um, yes. <laughs> thank you. So no questions, anybody just making sure? All right, thank you, Jenny. And your puppy was well behaved. <laughs> Mine just barked, but it sounded like a squeak toy, so you probably didn't hear it. Um, thank you. So moving right along, uh, the next item is resolution to consider adoption of the town manager's recommended 2022 through 26 portion of the 
uh, capital improvement program. And again, I'll ask Amanda if we received any comments so far on this item. Madam Mayor, we did not receive comments on this item. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, I'm going to recognize Dana Heiberg, who is one of our senior planners or the senior planner uh, for the staff report. Uh, Dana does not have video, so we will just be hearing from Dana and seeing his slides. So Dana, whenever thank you are you. ready. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I trust you can hear me. This is senior planner Dana Heiberg. Yes, sir. I hear you just fine. All right. Um, this year is a little unusual, but uh, once again, we do have our capital improvement program and it's gone through um, the process that we typically use. Next slide, please. Um, the purpose of the CIP, uh, it, it's always important to emphasize it's a planning document and that would be the case in any year, but I guess especially this year. Uh, it does consist of a six-year schedule, as you all know. Uh, it is reviewed and recommended by the Planning Commission to the town manager, as the Virginia Code allows, and, uh, and then the town manager uh, is now recommending a program to the town council. Uh, it reflects and effectuates the town's goals as expressed in the council's vision. Uh, and of course, the first year of the CIP was adopted with your operating budget. And, uh, and so we're really, what we're considering uh, tonight and next week is, of course, beyond the budget year, the fact uh, the CIP, the out years, as we sometimes say, uh, it, it's a proposed plan to fund projects and, from concept through design and construction. Next slide, please. So uh, obviously this uh, proposed CIP was developed uh, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic uh, situation. The new reality is really an unprecedented physical situation. Um, achievement of these projects that have been laid out in the CIP is really uncertain and it's going to be that way for the foreseeable future due to the physical uncertainties. Uh, what was a calculated plan really has become an aspirational document. Next slide, please. So I'm going to give you an overview of the CIP uh, as it has gone through uh, the, the process that uh, we uh, go through each year, uh, but with, again, with the caveats that I've mentioned. So next slide, please. So we have 48 projects proposed, uh, 36 general fund projects, uh, 12 projects within the, the enterprise funds. And of course your enterprise funds are uh, the golf course as an enterprise fund, water and sewer, uh, cemetery, and downtown parking. So those are your enterprise funds. Uh, we do have some new projects this year, uh, and I've listed these. Um, projects below. I'm not going to uh, mention all of them. Uh, we have uh, the Central Elden Walkability Grant Project funded through uh, what we call TAP Funding Transportation Alternatives Program through VDOT, a really significant grant. Um, and we have other initiatives uh, as listed. Um, next slide, please. So. Uh, the really large uh, VDOT projects, uh, the VDOT administered transportation projects. Um, East Elton Street is over $50 million. Um, VDOT revenue sharing is a 50% match. Uh, we are pursuing that uh, in order to reduce the current short shortfalls that we, we have to um, that the town is covering uh, when you look at the details of the project sheet, and you'll see that uh, there is a significant funding through general obligation bond funding for that project. And the same goes for uh, Hernan Parkway, Spring Street to Fairfax County Parkway. Um, again, pursuing VDOT revenue sharing is a 50% match. Um, 
we've been very successful in the past with revenue sharing, I would say, as a whole. But uh, in this current funding environment, uh, we really cannot be, uh, we cannot really prognosticate, I don't think, about whether or not we're going to be successful or, or to what extent we're going to be successful with revenue sharing. Next slide, please. Uh, so we laid out these um, categories, which was a little different approach this year, and I think is uh, valuable uh, and supportive of, of our various um, emphases and approaches. So the largest category is this multimodal transportation enhancement. Um, very significant, of course, uh, projects. Most of these I think you're familiar with, the large street projects, um, some smaller projects. Uh, we've got several significant uh, bicycle and pedestrian-oriented projects, uh, street lights, um, wayfinding signs. So uh, quite a number of projects that are what we call complete streets. Uh, type of approach for, for street projects and then other projects that uh, are addressing specific bicycle facilities or wayfinding signs or street lights or what have you. Next slide, please. Um, two more important categories, government facilities and infrastructure, uh, significant activities, uh, the critical to to uh, the, the operations of this, this government and, and the service that are provided to town citizens, um, information technology, town-wide security, uh, an important new project, our police exterior garage a little farther out in this CIP, police server room, a really critical um, effort uh, associated with um, the the important preservation, I would say, or uh, uh, the important maintenance of, of the, the appropriate uh, cool environment for those uh, servers and other uh, routers and high-tech equipment that uh, we need to provide the, uh, the fully adequate uh, heating, ven ventilation, air conditioning, and also we're, we're doing some space expansion within that, that space to, to uh, enhance the uh, the environment, the air uh, space, the ability to, to keep it cool and so forth. Um, and then uh, last on on listed on here as government facilities and infrastructures are downtown redevelopment, and we do have a, a specific uh, piece of that, if you will, that we are uh, taking on as a town, and that's the art center interior. The uh, Comstock project uh, partnership, which would provide the shelf facility with the town, uh, then doing the interior build out. Over in stormwater management, environmental enhancement, uh, we do have the storm drainage improvements. There are a variety of uh, our typical efforts um, that you see each year. It is funded by the county stormwater tax, as is stream restoration really important to uh, the water quality and our efforts, uh, our various efforts to enhance Chesapeake Bay and to enhance uh, just the general uh, condition of our, our surface waters. Next slide, please. Uh, additional categories, uh, of course, parks and recreation always uh, Important effort, we have uh, sports field and park improvements project uh, that is typical uh, each year. We have a number of improvements with that coming along in FY 22 and 23. We have Brady Park Tennis Court. Uh, I believe that's mainly working with the reserve amount, so it, that's coming up. Uh, in the shorter term, we have WOD trail lighting, 
park equipment re replacement. Uh, the Herndon Community Center Phase 5, the Trailside Skate Park expansion, Running Meat Park Nature Center, and Town Hall Square. So certainly some of the efforts are, are farther out and require the major general obligation bond type of funding. Golf Course Enterprise Fund, we are really uh, looking out farther with that type of project. We're, we will be doing additional study. Um, there's a need to renovate and expand the 40-year-old clubhouse. Um, but at this time, that, um, that's not in the near term, but rather it's a project that's farther out. Next slide, please. Uh, water and sewer fund, always critical infrastructure for the town. And um, so we have, uh, I think, a pretty similar program to what was presented last year with the major investments, uh, some adjustments in uh, total cost, but uh, fairly consistent there. Um, general water maintenance and replacement. Um, and several of these projects that you will recall from last year. Um, the biggest projects, I would say, being, of course, the, the sewer conveyance and then related to that sewer capacity purchase. Um, that capacity purchase is now slated for FY22. Uh, these are a revenue bond supported type of commitment. Um, downtown Parking Fund, we have the Downtown Parking Capital Contribution, which is a near-term um, uh, commitment uh, laid out for an additional $2.6 million in FY22, with a total $3.6 million. And then we have the Chestnut Grove Cemetery Master Plan effort. Uh, Mr. Heiberg, did we lose you? Yeah, I don't hear Dana on. Um, I'm sure we'll try to get him. Okay. Let me just let me just carry on. I'm, uh, thank you. Oh, are, are Dana, you? you back? Testing. Yep. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, we can it. hear you. Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, I don't know what happened there. I'm sorry. Uh, so we have our our uh, typical sources of funding. Uh, that support the CIP, and it's a, it's a broad mix, uh, including uh, general fund revenues, obviously uh, a very substantial amount of grant funding. We do have some proper commitments. Um, we will be doing uh, planning to do uh, general obligation bond financing for some of the major projects. Uh, we have a very small amount of, of some reallocated type of funding. We have the golf course fund, of course, uh, which is an independent enterprise fund that supports uh, the golf courts improvement efforts. Uh, with water and sewer, we have both operating revenue and then we have revenue bond funding. So those are not general obligation bond uh, type of bonds, but they are uh, based on the revenues of that fund. So it's a revenue bond. Uh, Fairfax County portion of the water and sewer is uh, something that we've we've had in the last couple of CIPs. So we do have some significant support there from the county. And then with Downtown Parking Enterprise Fund, uh, we also have um, some additional general obligation bond. And so that is the mix of funding, which uh, is really detailed on your sources uh, attachment and really gets into the year by year and the dollars from each type of funding that support the various projects. But that's the, uh, that's the full. Next slide, please.
Uh, Dana, if you're talking, I don't think we can hear you. Can you hear me now? There you are. I don't know what the intermittent thing is. I'm very sorry. No, it's no problem. We've all had some kind of issue through this adventure, so no problem. Okay, uh, and we're getting close to the conclusion here. So the uh, the uh, CIP, as proposed, I mean, there is alignment with the comprehensive plan and, and other policies of the town, as you would expect, and, and major projects that uh, are included in the comprehensive plan are, are items such as the East Elton Street and Spring Street improvements, the Downtown Parking and Art Center, the Running Meat Nature Center, the Community Center Phase 5, the Metro Rail Station, uh, transit oriented core where we have improvement projects, both the uh, bus bays, as we call them, which is the vehicle and pedestrian access along Hernan Parkway, as well as that Metro Rail Promenade project. Um, other major infrastructure CIP projects are necessary to support the redevelopment that is laid out in the comprehensive plan, so they go hand in hand. Uh, and I also wanted to mention that we do have several projects that address the 18 action items from the Town Council's uh, pedestrian plan. Um, and so uh, 12 additional items such as the high visibility crosswalks and pedestrian accessible signals and things of that nature that were in the pedestrian plan. They're, they're kind of in the maintenance category. So, uh, so really you don't rise to the uh, level of this uh, type of EIP effort. Um, next slide, please. Okay, the future situation. Next slide, please. We really have to look at the funding amounts and sources within the document uh, as no longer being assured. Uh, despite you know all the work that's gone into this, the, the realities are just upon us, and, and funding will be greatly reduced overall. We know that uh, enterprise fund monetary resources are less exposed. Uh, Although enterprise fund monetary resources are less exposed, they they may face downward pressure and uncertainty as well. So that's that's next slide, please. Um, so the path forward, we're going to reassess uh, based upon future revenue outlook and. Kind of, I think, a continual assessment of of the revenue picture and the recovery from this pandemic. Grant funded projects are going to be a priority, of course. I mean, we want to ensure the greatest possible benefit from grant funding, uh, and and we have a situation where these funds generally have already been allocated, uh, in some cases received by the town. So forth. We, we want to provide several of the needed transportation projects uh, so that we can keep moving those forward. They're complex, multi year projects often, and uh, we certainly want to keep moving forward. We want to prepare for the arrival of Metro Rail and, and the future uh, revenue generating development that, that should come with redevelopment in that area. And uh, so we, we want to be sure and set that infrastructure stage for that uh, future tax base. So staff will return to council with periodic updates and recommendations. I know that's a, a key point. Next slide, please. Uh, the staff recommendation. At this time, we'll, we'll recommend uh, that you approve the resolution dated uh, June 9, 2020, at your public hearing next week. Uh, of course, it, it's the typical resolution describing the standard CIP process. It does provide, uh, or it does uh, reference, I would say, it, it references the Planning Commission's pre-COVID recommendation. Remember, the Planning Commission recommendation was back, I think it was February 23rd or 24th. So none of this COVID stuff had really come out at that point. Um, so the, and 
further, the resolution, uh, the resolution uh, of course, approves and adopts uh, this VIP. And, and it does, we did add the, uh, the, the language that is really important at this stage, and, and it's really just uh, some additional caveat that uh, the funding shown is dependent on future revenue. So that concludes the staff report. Okay, thank you, Dana. Um, hold on, I've got to flip so I can see my colleagues instead of the presentation. There we go. Um, what questions do you have for Dana? Anybody? No? Not much to ask when everything's dependent on funds we don't have. <laughs> um, anybody? Okay. Dana, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. Thank you. All right, um, so that brings us to roundtable um, and our comments are limited to, as you know, I don't have to tell you, you've been here all summer. So um, who would like to go first? Who, who has comments? Y'all are so chatty tonight. Nobody? Well, okay. Well, Mr. Town Manager, do you have further comments for us? Nothing, Madam Mayor, thank you. All right, you guys. Well, that concludes our agenda this evening. So I will entertain a motion to adjourn. This is Chief McCollum, Madam Mayor. I move to adjourn, seeing there's no other business. I second that. All right. So we have a motion, shockingly, by the Vice Mayor and seconded by Mr. DeCall. If there's no discussion on that motion, I will um, ask the clerk to please call the roll. I almost forgot. <laughs> no problem. Vice Mayor Olam. Vice Mayor Olam, yes. Council Member Baker. Jennifer Baker, yes. Council Member Delagula. Council Member Delagula, yes. Council Member DeCall. Council Member DeCall, yes. Council Member Friedrichs. Council Member Friedrichs, yes. Well, McKenna is absent and Mayor Merkel. Yes. So that motion carries six to zero with one. Um, absence and we stand adjourned at 8 11 p.m thank you all for being here and for your support of everything that we're doing right now I really appreciate it <laughs>